Hello, one and all, and welcome to Web EV uh, Talk Series. This is a podcast. My name is Jan Lötval, and I'm a professor in Gothenburg in Sweden. Today, I welcome Samir El Andalusi, who's an associate professor at the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm, Sweden. And Samir has been working on exosomes or extracellular vesicles for probably 10 years. Welcome to the uh, podcast, Samir. Thank you very much, Jan. Thanks for the kind introduction. So tell us a little bit about yourself and and uh, and your current work and so on. Yeah, so yeah, maybe I can just give a brief background. So my my I mean I'm I'm educated as cell biologist, um, but I I kind of switched gears while doing my PhD studies, uh, entering more neurochemistry and a little bit of organic chemistry actually, um, working on trying to develop so-called cell penetrating peptides. Uh, with the aim of delivering uh, nucleic acid-based drugs. Uh, so that's what I did my PhD on, and I really got hooked into the the, nu the nucleic acid delivery field in whole. I mean, not with a specific uh, indication treatment, but but just generally improving delivery of RNA therapies. And so you did that uh, PhD in, in Stockholm? Yes, at Stockholm University. So I graduated from my PhD in 2008. I worked with Professor okay. Rolangel at the time. Um, I then moved on to Karolinska, continued some of this CPP work, and that's how I met my uh, my second postdoc uh, mentor, Matthew Wood uh, from Oxford. He was an opponent on the dissertation here at Karolinska, and I thought that these 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 vesicles seemed like a cool thing. He had just published yeah. this paper paper in Nature Biotechnology, or was about to publish that that. You can load RNA into exosomes and target them to brain, and of course, spring you know, 2011, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah. So I moved. I moved over. I think we met in December. I moved over in January or February. Brought the whole family. Uh, yeah. And then I was basically thrown into the exosome fields. That's how it started. Although I've always had this peptide work on a back burner. So today, right. in, in my lab today, you know. When I came to Oxford, the idea was to deliver sRNAs and, and target it, use targeted exosomes. Uh, but I realized that there were a lot of challenges with, with trying to put something big into a vesicle from the outside. Uh, yeah. So, we, so I, I kind of, when I moved back to Sweden in, in 2012 to uh, 2013 and set up my own lab, I ventured more into the, to the endogenous loading strategies, trying to genetically manipulate cells to, to load uh, RNA cargoes. Uh, but also proteins, and and actually what I built my lab on, and that we now eventually hopefully can publish this year, is instead of putting targeting ligands on the surface of exosomes, we developed systems to to express receptor proteins um, that could sequester, you know, whatever factor it's it's directed against, uh, by but removing the signaling domains, and we call them decoy exosomes. So that's something we've worked on quite quite a lot in relation to inflammation. Um, but but essentially, so IL six receptors and things like that. Yes, and TNF alpha. We've done that for a whole range. IL twenty three. We've done that for a couple of different cytokines, but also non cytokine circulating factors. So that's um, uh, that's sort of functioning like an antibody, more or less. Exactly. It, 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 but the beauty is, of course, with an exosome, you can build in many modules in one vesicle. So you don't need to have only a TNF receptor, only an IL six receptor. You can ah, have you can have multiple. multiple. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. So that has kind of been. Uh, and of course, we've done so building this. We've done a lot of engineering work, and naturally, of course, we've also done a lot of RNA loading work. Um, mm -hmm. uh, not just not just proteins, but but so I would say so it's kind of switch focused from from a lot of exogenous drug delivery, so to speak, to more um, trying to, to to load drugs uh, by endogenous ways uh, in the cells. Um, so right now, my lab. I mean, we are working. We are working on trying to get extrahepatic delivery, either protein therapeutics or RNA therapeutics broadly. Uh, and and that extrahepatic, so non-liver yeah. targets, basically. Yes. I mean, of course, liver as well. But but I think the key and what is interesting with the, with the exosome technology as a whole is that it, you're not limited to hepatocytes or Cooper cells. I mean, liver only. Yeah. Um, and I think that is the, the, the real difference compared to the using lipid nanoparticles. Uh, lipid nanoparticles are super potent. They are clinically used now for RNAi, yeah. um, probably very soon for mRNA, uh, uh, and they, they deliver efficiently to hepatocytes. So I think really the space where exosomes offer something is beyond, beyond liver. Beyond the liver. Yeah. And so you've been working with lipid nanoparticles as well or uh, yes, we as delivery vectors, right? 
Yes, a little bit, but mostly just for comparisons. Uh, we are doing more of that because we were recently funded through uh, Horizon Grant together with Ray yeah. Kiflers in Utrecht um, to, to deliver mRNA drugs. Um, and, and there we use LMPs, although our main part of that program is actually using cell penetrating peptides. And that's, so I still have a small piece of my lab still working on developing these peptides rather than exosomes, uh, where we also have actually quite some interesting data where we seem to be able to deliver quite significant amounts of mRNA to lung and spleen, for example, mm -hmm. uh, but actually bypassing liver, which we think is very interesting because we, yeah. um, if we look at biodistribution, and I think this is an important aspect, and you just measure, let's say, fluorescence, what we see is that the, the bulk mass of what we inject actually ends up in liver. But if we do the functional readout, so the expression of the mRNA, it looks completely different. Uh, That's interesting. So I then, mean, you have to remember that the liver, you know, you inject anything into the into the vasculature, mm -hmm. it will shine, it will be in the liver because the liver is absolutely packed with blood. I don't know how many liters of blood is in there, but yeah. a lot. Uh, but uh, yeah, so that is if you do imaging. But if you do, it, if you look for expression, you need to actually be inside the cells. So and right, I agree of course. With that, but but we actually, even when we do perfusions and we remove all blood, uh, there is, so there is a very fast uptake into liver cells. I mean, of exosomes and peptide nanoparticles. It's just my, my belief is that in many cases, these are cleared by monocytes in these or in, in livers. So monocytes, cook for cells. Cook, cook for cells will, will, you know, take it up and then it will right. digest it basically. So, yeah. And that's something that we see with certain exosome sources as well, and that it seems to differ depending on what exosome source you're working with, what, which cell types actually in each tissue that are taking up the EV. Yeah, you've done some work where you compare different types of cells. Uh, yeah. My read on that, and I'll just tell you face to face, that the difference is not that big. No, no, it's not. No, and so this. Yeah. But what I can't like. It, let me put it this way: the, the grossly the biodistribution is very similar. Right. But what exactly. But what, what, what we are now seeing is that the cell type tropism is exceptionally unique to the exosome source. So you may have exosome source one; it goes to right. liver exactly like exosome source two. Right. The cell types that they are taking up functionally in, in liver I is see. vastly different, and this is true for other organs that we're looking at. So we're using a Kind of a single cell RNA sequencing approach, not only to tell which cells we're taking ex are taking up exosomes, but what copy numbers if we use human exosomes in mice. That's good. And, and, uh, so, so, so I, I would agree if you just look at biodistribution, and this is why I think it's important to look beyond only biodistribution. Um, yeah. Um, or that you get this cell resolution, but but uh, and also another aspect is of course that clearance rates are differ between different exosomes. Or I see. So, yeah. Uh, many are, as we spoke about before, are right. cleared super fast. I mean, I mean, it's cleared so fast that we we have difficulties picking it up in plasma. At, you know, thirty minutes is very little left. But yeah. there are certain more immunoprivileged exosome sources that seem to actually stay in circulation longer. That's cool. So I think it depends a lot on what 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 they have and what they associate. Yeah. With. So the way I think about by distribution of extracellulosicals is that first you have to think about the organ they go to, yeah. which is to a large extent, liver, when you inject intravenously. Then you have to look at, as you say, which cell they go to. Yep. And then you have to look at which intracellular compartment they go to. And yep. then you look at the functional readout, right? Yeah. I think the key... So it's, it's a bit complicated. I think long term, it will be important. Like you, I think one should always complement biodistribution and bioavailability. So when we do our graph plots, for example, for our peptide work, when we deal with peptide nanoparticles, then we have a Psi labeled mRNA, let's say a Psi 5 labeled mRNA, and that mRNA encodes for another fluorescent protein. Then what we do, we do imaging for the distribution, so the biodistribution by right. for Psi 5. But in the very same samples we run and do the bioavailability, meaning I mean the expression of your mRNA. Right. Right, and right. This is Functional how we came, readout. This is how we came to realize that, you know, if we were to just track our peptide nanoparticles and not look at functionality, we would have all thought that liver is the main site of activity. But yeah, it turns exactly. out that, that is not the case uh, and, and that it actually has a pretty good distribution beyond liver, which is, in my mind, quite exciting. Um, yeah. You know, it's not directly related to exosomes, but yeah. Right. It's, it's difficult to get into some organs like, uh, you know, uh, joints or... 
brain yeah. and stuff like that. But uh, if you take the right approach, maybe it's uh, maybe it's possible. So so, but if, when you're introducing this, it's clear that your mindset is really focused on developing therapeutic extracellular vesicles, right? Yeah, in the end of the day, or I would say that my lab on the exosome side would be kind of developing the technology rather than being I'm quite agnostic to what the treatment would be. I mean, of course, we yeah. can develop things that can be used as treatment in the end. I mean, that's what we all strive for. Yeah. But I think we are not like, you know, I'm now today going to get a cure for multiple sclerosis. That's not really right. the case. We just use an MS model because we think that our cytokine approach in that model is, is uh, sensible. But we are more, yeah, and that's why we also collaborate. And if we, because if we, if we develop loading strategies that seem to be really working, of course you can replace for any protein or RNA. Uh, mm -hmm. So, and yeah, that's kind of how. Uh, no, I totally agree with you. I think uh, when when you do it, I'm also, of course, very interested in developing therapeutics, and I, I, as you, believe in the intrinsic biology of the vesicles, and they are definitely different from different cell types. Vastly different. Yeah. Uh, sometimes even the opposite, right? Uh, can be pro-inflammatory, anti-inflammatory, for example, as a as a general in general terms. But yeah. um, so where was I going? So uh, you have been you have been uh, trying to understand the basic function of vesicles, and that's how you're trying to optimize the vesicles. Is that is that what I'm hearing? No, it, I, yeah, well, it, it's two sides to it. One is to understand the native functions. And of course, we try to understand that with the cell sources that we think are, would be relevant to develop clinically. But I think what we're yeah. doing is we are studying, we're trying to explore how things are getting sorted into exosomes and basically hijack those mechanisms. So basically what you're say, telling me, Samir, is that you really have to understand the basic functions of vesicles of different types of to really optimize the development of therapeutics for, for clinical true true use. Yeah, I think that is that is one side, but the other side is to understand how cells really upload their cargoes into exosomes and, and, and make make use of the best pathways to introduce your protein of interest or your RNA of interest into exosomes. Right. That's one part. And the other part is of course understanding what is what are your exosomes doing biologically. And I think this is you know, EVs do all sorts of stuff, but I think what I'm missing, especially when it comes to mesenchymal stem cells, and I mean, it's, that is probably the most populated area in the in the EV space, where a lot of people work with these EVs, is that I rarely, when you read publications, you rarely see proper dose responses. You rarely see comparison of an MSC with a fibroblast, for example, or, or another, rel I mean, related. They're cousins, aren't they? Yeah. No, so so there there are a lot of like in and that's true for most of the work in the exosome space. I mean, it's because it's also a very difficult space to be in. But it's this use of proper controls and showing those responses. I mean, this is largely I would say missing uh, because you know you add something to a cell and you see all this interesting biology happening with one time point with one concentration. And I mean, yeah. that's how most papers are built. And if you were to take that type of research into where I came from an RNA delivery and you work with sRNA delivery, you would never be able to publish that because yeah. a one off silencing experiment doesn't tell you anything. And I think that's something we should, all of us or the whole field need to kind of promote or, or be Think about, yes, think, think about, about careful it. controls and the dose yes. response curves. Absolutely, Positive, I totally agree with that. control, dose responses. And if we want to say that we have native biology of these EVs that is inherent because it's a stem cell, let's say, then yeah. it would be very important to show that this does not happen when you don't have a stem cell. Right, right, right. So these are the kind of things that I think are, are missing and which is also making it hard for people that are not in the field to fully judge the potential of, of what we are using. So, so one of the issues, uh, uh, Samir, that a lot of people are experiencing is that the exosomes that are loaded with a functional molecule end up in the in the lysosomal pathway. So, yeah. so what you're thinking about that? Because if you go to the lysosomes, if you if you have a molecule that needs to go through the lysosome, that's a good thing. But if you have a molecule that is degraded at, by the lysosome, it's a bad thing. So, yeah. how do you how do you look at that? No, so I think, I mean, endosomal entrapment has been, you know, that's the million dollar question that everybody has yeah. struggled to solve <laughs> in a non-viral gene therapy field for, I would say, the last 30 years. So 
obviously it is an issue and and it's evs it's it's very it's really and that's one of my what puzzles me is that there you have all these reports showing really showing functional rna delivery for example mm -hmm. so it's no clear question that rna has to go out of the endosomes but how that happens with, with evs it's it's unclear i think what we do know is that the second we put the viral fusogenic protein on an exosome for example it works beautifully because we get fusion and you get release of the material this at the surface probably use, right or? yeah so people use vsvg for example and other other mm -hmm. viral proteins like what that you know what retroviruses are using and that's why they are potent they they all go through endocytosis so this is nothing strange we can't bypass that uh, the question is just how can we improve that what can we make mm -hmm. uh, how can we structurally modify evs so that they get you know better released um I, but if you were to like back calculate, actually, if you look at absolute quantities of a therapeutic RNA, let's say in an EV, we are talking about incredibly tiny amounts, generally speaking, in most papers that are published in the in the, in the delivery space. Yet you have the biology. You get a, you get a biological response from that RNA. So somehow it is actually, I think that the release from exosomes, even though we don't know how it works, must be very efficient. Because if you were to take a lipid yeah. particle, and we've done those in vitro and in vivo tests, you just need to put so much more on cells to, first of all, in the first place, get it endocytosed. Because you right. need an aggreg aggregation-driven uptake mechanism when it comes to most of these um, lipid nanoparticles and cationic polymers. Whereas EVs, they really enter as single entities in many cases. Okay. They enter right. one by one, exactly like a virus. If you were to look at, the, at some of the most infectious uh, enveloped viruses, it looks very similar when an EV, if you do really single, if you can image mm -hmm. very high resolution. And that's what we published a few years back in time, or Nicole Meissner at the time, she was at Novartis. We did we did this like really tracking individual exosomes yeah. at the point of binding. And what one of the interesting um, findings with that study was actually that, yes, they are going through the endolysosomal pathway and the vast majority ends up in lysosomes. But before getting there, they scanned the rough ER it seems like they really go, these vesicles travel along the rough ER, and rough ER is actually where 90% of all RNAi takes place. So there mm -hmm. may be something happening during that transition. Oh, that's cool. When vesicles are yeah. uh, kind of tagging along the rough ER. But honestly, I don't actually know, and it is puzzling that exosomes can deliver. Uh, in light of the fact that when we study them, we see that they are endocytosed and very little is released with the, with the tools yeah. that we have to study that. Um, so the, the, my mindset around around that is, now, is that as we discussed prior to to starting the the discussion uh, or the recording is that there are not many RNA molecules of a specific RNA in each vesicle, maybe less than one. Normally, you can maybe get it to one or, or two or or ten yeah, yeah. in some instances. Yeah, with absolutely best strategies. I mean, yeah, I think normally it's not even one in a hundred. Uh, by mayor over it. So my, my, my mindset is that it's possible or even likely that uh, not all exosomes or vesicles do deliver their cargo or do deliver their, uh, their cytosolic RNA or vesiculosolic <laughs> uh, RNA to the cytoplasm of the cell, but maybe a small proportion of them do. And we, are, we have this issue of not understanding, <clears throat> excuse me, exactly uh, which of the subpopulations do it. And if we did, we could characterize Rich. them quite well, look at their membrane proteins and dissect that mechanism through bioinformatics and experiments, basically. Yeah, yeah. no, no, I agree. And I actually think that uh, like that, that there is really a pool of active EVs and there is one secretory vesicular pathway that is just to clear material from the cell. I think, um, you know, I think in yeah. it would make sense. It, it takes a lot of energy to go through proteosomal degradation or autophagy. I mean, these right. other processes. Uh, and at, at points, I think that secreting it and letting Kupfer cells in liver just take care of the waste is actually a, a brilliant mechanism. I mean, it would also make sense for the body to do that. So yeah, yeah. when we deal with them, I certainly believe that you have an active pool and you probably have a lot of vesicles that are, if not just that they're not active, they may even compete with the active ones. Oh, yeah, okay, so they might be blocking. And also, the other aspect is that vesicles could very well be food for other cells. Yeah, no, no. And that, that, I, that I, is, I also think, because if you look at the RNA content, at least when we've done RNA analysis and proteomics on, on EVs, 
you find a lot of you know RNA fragments, tRNA fragments. You find a lot of like goodies that could be used. Uh, yeah, the proteins that uh, geo geo terms for you know translation and ribosome proteins they are massively overrepresented, and yes. they could of course be used immediately in in a recipient cell that is in need of that. So I I I think that 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 could be. Uh, definitely be the case. That may also explain because most times you add exosomes to cells, proliferation goes up. Mm -hmm. Yes. I mean, if you were to really monitor it, you will see that it's and and that's a huge issue because when you do certain experiments, you have the problem that the baselines are starting to change because of the inherent, right. not because of your drug, but the fact that you're putting a lot of nutrients on the cells, basically. So some of the early experiments, they lyse the exosomes or exosomal vesicles, and it could lose functionality by by doing that, presumably yeah. because they lost the cytosolic proteins or the cytosolic uh, uh, vesicle solic yeah. uh, um, molecules, right? That could potentially yeah. be functional. So that's uh, that's one of the one of the one of the aspects there. So but yeah, I, we I met. Think... We met. What's, what's that, what are you saying? No, no, I just just my general view on this. Let's say the native. Just b before we close that, but I mean a lot of the. The innate roles of, let's say, stem cell exosomes. I actually, mm -hmm. I'm not, I'm not, a, I'm not convinced that this is by the messages that they carry inside that is really giving the biology. I think that these are a lot of kind of kiss and run mechanisms. I mean, you have EVs that can act on several receptors on a recipient cell and thereby induce signaling that is fast because in all, almost all models where you look at regeneration or anti-inflammatory mm -hmm. effects with MSC EVs. The effects are extremely rapid. They, this happens within a day, and it, in clinical trials with MSCs, it happens yeah. very fast. And for me, that that yes. would be RNA mediated. If you think about the kinetics and the time it takes to deliver a micro, it's unlikely, right? And the half life of the protein, it doesn't make sense. Just so I think. So I'll I'll I'll, I'll tell you, this is not published yet, but you know we're we're working on a manuscript where we emptied the the mesochemist stem cell vesicles from their RNA content and DNA and what have you, and also. And you still have to perfectly maintain functionality. So, I told so you maybe, maybe I shouldn't speak about that in this uh, in this YouTube channel. But, no, but, but you can blog about that. your data and then still publish. So, so I, I think uh, I think would, uh, you know that would be very nice to 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 see. Uh, and that I think that I I believe in totally, uh, Jan. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so so yeah. So that's interesting. Uh, and, and yeah. So clearly, both you and I have an interest in developing therapeutics. So we're taking different. Approaches. I still think mesenchymal stem cell vesicles are are a helpful source to make vesicles from. Uh, if you if you want to develop something that is anti-inflammatory, uh, you could very well engineer cells. And, and clearly, you've been working a lot with engineering cells. I presume yeah. that's HEC two nine three cells. No, we we so we have we ne so we do a lot of the genetic screens initially. We do in HEC two nine three. Most of what goes into mice are not HEC two nine three. They are different MSC sources. Or amniotic cells and other cell types. And okay. So, uh, and and one of the reasons is, and we know that, and it's unpublished, but you know the clearance of HEC EVs is 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 very very fast. fast. And it's very fast for a reason. So I don't right. think you know. They, but a lot of people work with HEC EVs, and that's why they go yeah. for immuno oncology or monocytes and these kind of applications. I mean, yeah, yeah. companies do that. Uh, but uh, yes. yeah, it's uh, no. But a lot of people and a lot of companies do work use. Yeah. Yeah. Heck like cells, and it's nothing wrong depending on what you, but what you want to do. Yeah. Uh, but but we have done a lot of yeah, we have we do hex cells as well, but we do different MSC lines as well. So and trying to compare them. Um, I mean, of course, do as you know, it's the convenient thing working with hex is that it's super easy to transduce or transfect. I yeah. think a very important learning though is that. I don't really like when people only do transfections and then you do delivery experiments. Because when you transiently transfect a cell, you can never be sure that you're removing the transfection reagent. I think sometimes yeah, exactly. the delivery capacity of the EVs, it may unfortunately be residual transfection reagent there. Therefore, I would strongly encourage any of these RNA delivery studies, at least when it comes to luminal or cellular delivery, I would really uh, opt to have stable cell lines. Because otherwise, you you can never guarantee you don't know. it's not a transfection effect. And, and so I, I've even seen people claim effect of exosomes by trans, using a transfection agent yeah. to load the exosomes directly. Exofect. Lipofectamine yeah. or something, exofect yeah. or whatever it is, right? Yeah. 
And then you don't have exosomes anymore. You don't have vesicles anymore. You have something with a transfection agent built into it, right? Yeah, yeah. So that's uh, that's uh, and, and not studying you... biology. Maybe it's functional still, but yeah, yeah, and 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 it's completely fine. It's but then it must be more clearly stated that this could be an effect or this is a hybrid system. And I mean, which is all fine if things work and they're safe. You know, it was more that the fact that there are n numerous papers showing this high high capacity delivery of RNA with exosomes, but that they have used Heck cells. That they have transiently transfected and then isolated exosomes right. those cultures. And one should be right. mindful that this may be some of the effects that we see could be uh, due to residual transfection reagents. That if you do stable cell lines, which we do in yeah. all our experiments, you avoid that problem because you they are genetically stable. You don't have any reagents there. Right. Um, so of course it's much more time consuming and it takes much more work to do but then you at least know that what you're looking in the end is is and i mean exosomes or vesicles vesicles the, the first time we met was in uh, december uh, 2011 as you said i was visiting matthew wood we were applying yeah. for an eu grant uh, we failed on the uh, on the last stretch i think uh, yeah. to get that grant unfortunately and and then we sort of disconnected and didn't interact much more with with Matthew. Um, but after that, Matthew and you started uh, Evox, yeah. Evox Therapeutics. So uh, you've been quite closely connected to uh, extracellular vesicles. Oxford, I guess, is the name of the company. Is is that correct? No, it's actually. Yeah. I don't know. We just thought it sounded like a cool name, but it, it it kind of makes sense that it would be extracellular vesicles, Oxford. Maybe that was the thinking behind it. I don't remember. So uh, tell us a little bit about that and what happened uh, back in 2013, 14 something, 15 maybe. Also, yeah. So actually, this the idea of doing a kind of trying to get a spin out started i mean the, the thinking started back in 2013 i think when i had set up my lab here when we had shown that the decoy exosomes were very active in different inflammation models we filed ip on that matthew obviously had his old work uh, on mm -hmm. targeting uh, targeting the cns and and i had a student that had graduated who is an european patent attorney Perlin, who is the third co-founder of evox and he said that, you know, he's happy to draft patents. You know, we've done the work. We put something together, make a business case. And we talked to people in Sweden. We met a few different investors in, in UK. And then mm -hmm. uh, in 2016, we um, we had a deal with uh, with OSI, so Oxford Science Innovation. So it's a local venture or VC uh, mm -hmm. firm that basic, that almost exclusively invest in Oxford spinouts. Very wealthy. Um, uh, investor investors so um, yeah so we found it we actually found the evox in april 2016 and that was the yeah. basis for that was the work that i've done at carolines get together with the work done by matthew then in oxford and that's that was yeah. about a year after or half a year after kodiak biosciences was yeah, started think, in I cambridge think, massachusetts yeah i think it was a year yeah a year later so how did you uh, so how how has your journey since then been I, I i know that you have been working a lot uh, in your academic lab yep. uh, with projects that are closely associated to evox so you you told me about that previously and yep. and um and I, i've done the same for other companies even before i started working with exosomes for with other companies for other questions in the field of asthma so but still tell us a little bit how how you were working Working with Evox for the first few years because it took a while before yeah. Evox even had a laboratory, and I guess yeah. all the development was happening in your lab at that time. Yeah, it did. It did. So I mean, the setup for the first half a year, a year at least, was basically I had sponsored research. So we have a central research agreement with Karolinska. Um, so we did a lot of the like the, you know optimizing, purification, cell banking. I mean these kind of things. Um, I've always even cell that, banking. Wow. No, or, or yeah, well, not as advanced as as GMP, but I mean, pro, like starting to right that part of my lab does. I mean, we started using more kind of industry-like protocols. That's actually on that in that, on that way, this has been really good because the way that my whole lab operates with documentation and and you know we have each and every single purification documented 
yields, starting volumes, how much goes into the TFF, what comes out of the TFF. So we can always track back all our EV batches that we send to others. And I think this would never have happened if it wasn't for the fact that we had EVOX, uh, because these things right. are, of course, critical. Um, and I it is this... different to to run research in in a company or do uh, R and D uh, R and D in a company or research in an academic lab for sure. Yeah, and I think it's a good mix. I mean, of course, like generally speaking, of course, this has been great for me. I mean, I have this research agreement still with Evox. We do do more. Let's say uh, we are not kind of company driven in the same sense, of course, as Evox or the main site is, because they, you know, mm -hmm. we are more kind of a when we have the innovative projects or the things that we want to mm -hmm. do of course sometimes you're a little bit backbound with with uh, you have to be mindful that okay this is you know industry sponsored money so you actually need to deliver something it's not like a right. VR grant and sometimes no. that can be annoying obviously you know i would love if vr gave me 12 million swedish crowns a year or something i mean then it's I would be happy. That will never happen. So um, no, uh, no. And you need to report and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> but generally speaking, I think we have a. I have a very good relationship with with. Uh, so Power, he is the C chief operating officer. So he was one of the co-founders, and Tony Depodjerol is the CEO. And we, I think, we have a kind of a mutual good view on what is reasonable to do in acad in an academic setting. You were gone for a while now. Uh, okay. Basically, you said generally speaking. Yeah, generally speaking, I think it is, it's been a good setup. We have we have a kind of joint view what makes sense to do in an academic environment and what mm -hmm. doesn't make sense. So I think, you know, but but of course it's it is since I have seven postdocs that are basically or six sponsored on an Evox grant, and then mm -hmm. and then I have twelve in the rest of the lab or thirteen people that are not let's say non Evox. Uh, mm -hmm. But we, I mean, I try to run this as a transparent and, and together, but of course there are certain, we, there is a little bit more steering on, on projects that you have industry money for, but that, yeah. that is not just Evox. I mean, that is true. I've had previous money from, from Moderna. I had research uh, funding from Moderna and, and from other companies. And of course you then are a little bit more bound to kind of deliver. It's, it's more uh, associated some degree to product development, I guess. And, yeah. and that's the sort of, uh, you have to be aware of that. It, there has a purpose of becoming something commercial, I guess, or, or therapeutic. And it's not blue sky research. It's, it's, uh, that yeah. could be part of it. That needs to, in my mind, that needs to be part of it. Because the big discoveries and the big, uh, uh, evolutions in, in understanding EVs, for example, is when you do something out of the box, right? Yeah. 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 Uh, you do something crazy or, or you, you find a molecule that shouldn't be there and you wonder, is it there or is it not there? And then you start digging and, and, yeah. and, you know, for example, RNA, right? RNA in vesicles. That was a crazy concept back 15 years ago. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, so so I think both are both are very important, uh, also for clinical translation. Yeah. <clears throat> no, this is why I think that's why I'm saying also that I think this is a good. It's actually the the academic and a de decently wealthy biotech kind of working together is. Yeah. I mean that has been good for Evox and it's been good for my. I mean the academic lab as well. Yeah. So I I see the synergies being greater than let's say the holdbacks of having having company money. Um, mm. And uh, yeah, and of course, you know, and they, it's very much also complementary work. And of course now Evox has huge capacity to do genetic screens that we don't have to do kind of like. Um, right. Yeah, so, and, and you know, get exosome sources in quantities for a project that, okay, I want to deliver this mRNA. Can I get, you know, 5E14 or whatever it is of, of yeah, yeah, okay. GMP grade EV source. I mean, that is of course super. 10 great. liters of cell culture yeah. or something. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So the, yeah, I, there there is a we can come up with new things and test and, and I mean I'm lucky to have a, we have a very good animal facility um, so we can do a lot of kind of yeah not get stuck to doing all only cell culture work uh, which I think yeah, yeah. is quite common also even in the EV space. Um, 
because things things are not an exosome in a cell culture is not an exosome in vivo and that is like that that yeah. is the major difference and what makes exosomes right. interesting because they can deliver in vivo but you may not actually see it deliver in vitro that's our experience uh, and if no, that is saying, in vast okay. contrast to you know all other non-viral delivery tools because they can right. be beautifully working in cell culture and the second you move into a mouse you see nothing so yeah I, and and I think there are many reasons for that. I mean, we isolate EVs and we disregard the fact that they associate with proteins in vivo in yeah, nature yeah. when they are secreted. They have a corona. This is something that when you do ultra pure purifications, you remove that. That may have yeah. implications on activity. Uh, cold cultures tend to work always work better than isolated EVs. I think there are also for good reasons. They're being secreted in the natural kind of more environment. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, I am. Um, and I think, so, and that generally, also that is something that we should look more into. What, how, what, how does, I mean, host factor adherence to exosomes? I think this is, I mean, largely. Open. What, what you have to repeat? One of the things we have to look into was. I think, like, how, how does exosomes associate with host factors? I mean, for years, at least right. in our lab, we've always thought, okay, this is contaminations. You know, we do ultra pure EV isolations on plasma or whatever, or we have this IgG contamination, or you have an apo lipoprotein contamination. But I'm not so. I mean, I don't think it's contaminations anymore. They are. They are part of the. They are part of that shell that is carried on the EVs. And when you make them ultra pure, non-covalently bound, non-membrane yes. proteins, basically. Yes. yes. Cor corona. There's a lot of glycoproteins and other things on the surface as absolutely. well, right? Absolutely. Uh, yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> which can stabilize proteins, which can provide new inter interaction surfaces to recipient cells, and um, and I think also that's so, one of the reasons. That it works in vivo and differently from in vivo. Yeah. Yeah. So, so a lot of people are are asking, you know, are those really vesicle associated proteins? Because they're, for example, albumin can be there or an a, an antibody, as you say, um, and, and and they're definitely there. They are there on the surface. You can discover them. You can identify them. You can shave them off with proteinase K and what have you. And and doesn't matter if you're isolating them with with uh, ultrasonification or flotation or cushion or or what have you, right? Yeah. So are they part of the vesicle? It's kind of philosophical because are you and I part of the planet Earth? We're not <laughs> covalently bound to the planet Earth, right? Exactly the same. But we are associated with the planet Earth uh, quite yeah. efficiently through gravitation and therefore we are part of the planet Earth. So. So I, I, I make that comparison sometime, right or wrong, I, but uh, no, just one. allow people to think about it a little bit differently. No, it's and, and this is like I think you know exosomes. It's a huge. There are huge surfaces in the blood, so they are they're perfect surfaces to adhere to. So I I, I don't yeah like to not sticky stuff that they, yeah. And I mean that association may also be one of the reasons driving you know clearance or that you go through certain right. cell types things I mean, like that. Uh, we we showed that we published a paper in Nature Communications last year. My postdoc did all that work, but he looked at the viral corona, looking at uh, at H, uh, HSV and RSV virus and RSV in in bronchiola lavage fluid, and how the corona protein really really has a huge impact on the infectivity of viruses and the immunity and the immune reactions. And you know, seeing that with viruses, and we've done a lot of. Uh, more work on that on that side, um, looking at other viruses, obviously. Um, I see no reason why host factor adherence wouldn't be important for EV uh, internalization. I mean, in the end of the day, I, you know, viruses are using very similar mechanisms to 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 the vesicle. Yeah. So so this is being recorded at the time of uh, the COVID nineteen yeah. uh, quarantine. Uh, hopefully, people will see it also after this quarantine period is over uh, so we just should maybe be clear about that and and one of the questions i'm asking some people that i speak with is 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 uh, sars cov 2 virus a uh, a, a vesicle mm. Well, I got you quiet there. That's interesting. Clearly, it has membrane components from the cell, right? I mean, if you would have asked me, is re as a retrovirus a, a, a vesicle? I would. My answer would be yes. Clearly, I think that this virus it has so. I mean, with the spikes. I mean, structurally, it's a little bit different. Right. But, but if it would have been a retrovirus, I think you could all argue that it's an exosome yeah. just with a few other components. Um. 
and uh, I mean, and I think this is, and that's 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 what we and what the people are already doing. But that's where we need to learn. I mean, the viruses have learned to use these pathways, but they right. just do it a little bit more efficiently. They or they have a very good uh, capacity to pack genome into their vesicles. Uh, that's what we need to learn and release. Then, then you know, we could do this. With, I mean, we would have an infectious exosome, but that is not spreading. Yeah, that's good. I think. That's, that should be interesting. So, uh, where, where are the, in your view, what are the next uh, or the unmet needs in EV research? What, what, what do we really need to learn to understand uh, EV function to make them even more efficient if, as future therapeutics, for example? Yeah, I think one of the what I would say as if we start with the therapeutic side, I think mm -hmm. half life extension will be critical. Mm -hmm. um, that's my my take. Uh, Do you think red blood cell red blood cell vesicles would solve that? I don't know, but they have their own other problems. I mean, it's not that those you're also limited to how you can engineer and what you can actually put there. Uh, right. So, so I think. Maybe they will. Yeah, just for, for transparency for the audience, they have CD47, which is supposed to yeah. be a don't eat me signal. So yeah. presumably red blood cell vesicles are not eaten up by macrophages as efficiently uh, as as other vesicles are. Then again, I'm not sure. I've seen firm proof of so that. We, but uh, so, we, so I have to say, I mean, we haven't published it, but I mean, it, and I don't think we will. But so we, of course, Try that we, with our best engineering principles, putting a lot of CD47 on heck exosomes or CD55, we see absolutely no half life extension. Mm -hmm. And we have confirmed that we have solid expression on EVs. Right, right, right. So it's not like the receptor isn't there, and that's why it's not. And, and you we, see we, as we, much we, uptake in macrophages as well. Yeah, there is no, like, we don't see um, if, I mean, if anything, if anything, uh, it looks like the clearance could be even faster. Which oh, wow. it could be, because if it's, the, yeah. But, um, yeah, so we, I'm It's not, not, definitely not. In your hands, it's not. And I don't think the CD47 by itself is the, uh, I don't think the CD47 by itself is the, uh, uh, the only factor for red blood cells not to be eaten by macrophages. No. There may be other molecules as well. Naughty boy, you're eating your snuff again. <laughs> I thought you wouldn't see that. <laughs> oh, I'm not blind, man. I'm not blind. It, 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 it makes this so much better, doesn't it? No, I don't know. This one I will keep, not remove. Okay. <laughs> so extended half-life tour. But it, you don't necessarily need to give EVs by intravenous route. No, no. I mean, that's another thing. Uh, uh, we have a paper that we're going to resubmit uh, where we've actually done that. So we've done subcut IP IV and looked at absolute quantifications of circulating EVs in blood uh, using bioluminescence imaging. Um, the, in our hands, the issue is if we do sub Q, we, you, of course, you get extended release, but the levels that reach plasma is very low. Mm -hmm. uh, intramuscular, we don't see anything going out or very little going out in blood. What I do think, though, is and, and, and I think, you know, there are a few groups starting with that is the whole RNA space in CNS diseases going into a mm -hmm. or ICV, that may be, um, you know, attractive. An opportunity, right. Yeah. yeah. So the way I see subcutaneous is that, uh, or IP as well for that matter, they go to the lymph system. Yeah. They go to lymph nodes, local lymph nodes primarily, and that's, um, and that's, that's well described uh, with bio, biodistribution studies. No. So, um, no, because I think, uh, I think what is, for me, what is very clear is that we, EVs, I, I really think they are super potent. If we solve sufficient loading, yeah. load enough protein is easier than loading enough RNA. But we are getting there. And if you then extend the half-life, you can really reach, you, you go across biological barriers that you don't do with the synthetic uh, systems. That's just, you know, that's my uh, firm belief. Uh, and that you can, the active dosing where you still see a biology is so much lower than what you would do with a synthetic delivery system. Uh, but to to really increase that, if you can extend half life, I think the important to mention yeah. when we talk about half lives, I'm talking about the plasma levels. That doesn't mean right. they're disappearing out of the body because it's also very rapid. No, of course not. Into, into tissues. Uh, exactly. Yeah. So. Uh, and there might be recirculation from the cell, yeah. a new vesicle yeah. coming out that yeah. you may have lost your tracer from, but it's yeah. still being sent out into circulation and distributing contributing to. And that sort of dynamic, I think, is also very important to understand and learn 
in the longer perspective, um, uh, you know, how, how vesicles change the phenotype of other vesicles being produced by that cell and so on and so forth. Yep. It's, it's just, we're, we're a bit early in, in, in and especially I think in, in subgroups of vesicles and what subgroups do. Um, yep. When you look at, when you look at physiology, of course, the cloud of vesicles contribute to the physiology and everything is part of it. Uh, but if you want to influence certain of, certain components of, of the vesicular secretome in general, uh, that's where you potentially can find a lot of interesting um, new ways of treating people and, and trying to to yeah. target um, disease in different ways. So, are you? Uh, we're coming towards the clo uh, end of the of the discussion, I guess. But are you going to be an EV researcher throughout your life? You know, a year or two ago, I would answer would actually be and probably be no, because I was so tired of, you know, having issues. Or the difficulties, right. Data, you know, but right. now, the la since the last two years, um, my confidence has grown that this will actually be. Um, so, I, yeah, my answer will be yes, I will probably stay in the vesicle field. There are so much still to do that is interesting to explore. Um, and, and I really think. Uh, seeing some of the recently published data out there, uh, as we talked about before, I think this sRNA paper from the Gibbings lab is actually very, I mean, very thorough, very low doses, mm -hmm. active doses, and you really see silencing. I mean, that talks, and it's, they have the perfect comparison with the C12-200 LMPs uh, developed by Dan Anderson's lab at uh, um, MIT. So, and our own internal data that we haven't been able to publish yet uh, suggests the same. You can use very low doses, but if we get, we still need to, in order to be able to produce exosomes at not enormous quantities, we need to sort the loading so that we don't need to dose as high as right. We can. Yeah. Because I mean, the, the issue is not you know we've done dose escalations or Evox has done in 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 higher uh, species and and others have done that, and they are tolerated. That's not that's not the issue. But from a production point of view, uh, if you need to yeah. deliver, you know, X amount of mRNA copies, you really need to try to get those mRNA copies into the vesicles. Otherwise, you need to mm -hmm. use a lot of vesicles. Um, yeah. And and um, I mean, maybe, so cost maybe of one... goods is a is a is a hurdle. Actually, you you're telling me that that CMC um, manufacturing basically is is a hurdle for. For future growth, if you're delivering mRNAs, maybe not for functional surface molecules, but for mRNA. Yeah, but I, and to be honest, I, I wouldn't, I would, I don't dare to say that because I don't know because I'm not involved in the CMC. But I just see it from, I mean, from an academic perspective, of doing preclinical work. It's just, mm -hmm. uh, you know, if we are treating 50 mice, I would prefer not to have to grow, you know, I don't know how many bioreactors or how many, you know, 2,000 plates. Mm -hmm. It doesn't really make sense because I really think that we can still improve we've already yeah. improved loading but i think still there is a, a, a potential to improve it more or maybe if we find better ways to promote endosomal escape we can also reduce the amounts that we need so release of the cargo and and cargo enrichment yeah if, if we it just you do slight increases there i think it's them i mean then it's that's a big big improvement yeah so yeah, people ask me, is it is it worth go into the EV field for young researchers? I'm saying, oh yeah, this yeah. this this field is going to evolve uh, over over many decades to come, far beyond our lifetimes probably. If you look at monoclonal antibodies, they were discovered first in in the 70s, right? Yeah. And now they're the expansion of therapeutics with monoclonal antibodies is is crazy. There's so many yeah. monoclonal antibody therapeutics out there, some some good, some excellent, and some maybe not optimal. But um, And I think we'll see the same with EVs. So you agree with that? Yep, I would agree with that. Anything else you want to finish, end up with, no, uh, I think, Samir? I think, I think we need to jointly in the community try to create proper mice models to study EV biology. That's I'm something that I'm missing, like given how many are now being in the EV space, and actually the research has gone on for quite some time, the best we can come up with is a Cree model with one system. Like I think we should think hard and, and maybe do joint efforts to create a few solid transgenic models where you can really in vivo look yeah. at proper cell-to-cell -cell communication because it's very few studies that are really proving that the communication takes place through EVs in vivo. Yeah. 
uh, not injecting EVs because I'm not interested in knowing how a uh, one right. to twelve EVs that is just getting bumped into a mouse, what's yeah, yeah, yeah. the tumor or whatever, because that right. is not the real biology. That is artificial, in my view. That's, I, I think that's that's good for a workshop or uh, or or an idea for a workshop. You can propose that to the ISO board and even host it and discuss different opportunities of developing. Uh, uh, animal models for for understanding mRNA f function in EVs, microRNA function in EVs, yep. uh, and different CRIS systems, what have you, right? Which yep. which was great when when that that came out. So, yep. well, thank you very much, uh, Samir. It was great to talk to you. We had a little bit of a connection issue uh, a few times, but but that's uh, that's secondary. It was good fun, and to everyone out there, thank you for listening, and thank you for staying with us for almost an hour now. And uh, stay tuned. There will be a lot of happening. Things happening. Bye. Thanks, Jan. Um, and um, uh, their functional molecules that you may have inside of them are kind of killed. Now you're putting a snooze in. I did. I said I wouldn't, <laughs> but I did. Sorry. I have to. The, you're just creating a lot of editing for me. That's the issue, <laughs> which is a new, new thing for me to learn.